Hi, my name is Martin Daxel and I'm a consultant in acute medicine. In this video, I will talk about physics of ultrasound. In this presentation, I want to talk about ultrasound physics, introduce different ultrasound modes, talk a little about nobology and how to examine a patient. Ultrasound waves are similar to sound waves. If you plot an ultrasound wave over time and measure the pressure, then you can see the amplitude of an ultrasound wave and one full cycle is called period. If we plot the ultrasound wave over distance, then one full cycle is called wavelengths. Frequency is defined as the amount of cycles over time and one hertz is one cycle per second. Looking at the pitch of sound, the standard pitch is anywhere between 20 Hz and 20 kHz. Sound below is called infrasound and blue whales, for instance, using that to communicate. Sounds above 20 kHz is called ultrasound and bats will locate their prey with ultrasound and they're using frequencies of around 100 kHz. Diagnostic ultrasound is anywhere between 1 and 20 MHz. Ultrasound was first used in the shipping industry with their sonar technology. If you send an ultrasound signal out and it takes a time to hit the ground, gets reflected back, takes another time, by knowing the velocity of the ultrasound in water, you can calculate how much water is below your boat. If you look at different tissues and the velocity of the sound in these tissues, then the denser our tissue is getting, the higher the velocities will be. And in fact, fat, water, kidneys, spleen, muscle and liver tissues, velocities are all in the same range, while air and bone are very far out. The ultrasound device itself needs to use a velocity to calculate the depths of our signals and it uses something pretty much in the middle between fat and liver. Looking at the central formula of ultrasound, this is velocity is frequency times wavelengths and the velocity in a given tissue is constant. What it means though is that if I use a higher frequency for my ultrasound, it will give me smaller wavelengths with a constant velocity, and that results in better resolution. Unfortunately though, higher frequency means also more attenuation of our sound waves, and that means that we can't go as deep with our examination field. The next graph shows the absorption of ultrasound in one centimeter of depths between different tissues and different frequencies. Now, what is immediately obvious is that bone, even with low frequencies, so the blue column, absorbs more than 90% of all the ultrasound in one centimeter of depths. At medium frequencies or high frequencies, all ultrasound is getting lost. Water and blood, on the other hand, don't absorb much ultrasound at all. That makes water a perfect window to look at deeper areas. What do I mean by that? We can use fluid-filled organs to use as windows, and in this case, the radiographers in the department like you to have a full bladder, what does not absorb much ultrasound and is the perfect window to look at deeper structures. The next slide shows how ultrasound waves are generated. We've got a piezoelectric element or crystal on top of our transducers. And if we put electricity, a current onto these crystals, ultrasound waves are generated. Once the ultrasound waves are reflected and are coming back to our crystal, a voltage is generated what the machine can measure. 
This is certainly true for most ultrasound devices. However, there are now newer technology where you use non-piezoelectric transducers. The device shown, for instance, has a single silicon chip, and so a single transducer can emulate any point-of-care ultrasound transducers. Next, we want to look at the echo principle. So we put a voltage on our ultrasound transducer, ultrasound is generated and takes time T1 to hit a tissue interface, there it gets reflected back to the ultrasound transducer and the ultrasound device can calculate the depths of the signal with the formula velocities distance over time. When ultrasound is sent out and hit a tissue interface, the impedance difference of both tissues are important. Impedance is resistance to ultrasound, and you can see that the impedances between fat and spleen are again in a similar range. Air and bone is very far out. The intensity of the echo is bigger the more different the impedances are between our tissues. This will result in a brighter speckle. I have an example on the next slide where I used a catheter pack and filled it up with water and added oil on top. And if you let this rest, you just have one interface between oil and water. And only on that interface we can get reflection and we can see a very bright line. If we shake the uh, solution, then we get many shades of gray because now we got millions of interfaces between oil and water and so we got millions of reflection coming back to our ultrasound probe. I have another couple of examples about impedance differences. So let's look to the lung surface. We got an interface between muscle and air. So we got 1.66 minus almost nothing divided by 1.66, added almost nothing, and we squared it. Adding the numbers to this equation results in a value very close to 1, meaning that all ultrasound is getting reflected back to the probe surface, resulting in a very bright line. Next, we want to look at the liver-kidney interface. And again, adding the numbers to this equation results in a very low number, meaning that almost no ultrasound gets reflected back to our probe, resulting in no kind of bright line between liver and kidney. We already spoke about reflection and absorption. There are, however, other attenuation of ultrasound as well, similar to sound waves. So there is refraction, dispersion, and divergence. Next, I want to talk about different ultrasound modes. The first one is A mode, and that's the oldest ultrasound mode. It is still used in eye ultrasound. Ultrasound signal gets sent out and wherever there is an impedance difference and an echo is coming back, the amplitude is measured and is shown over time. They used A mode in the past before the widespread use of CT scanners to, for instance, monitor midline shifts in uh, traumatic brain injuries. The most common mode of ultrasound is B mode or 2D mode, and that stands for brightness. Ultrasound signals are sent out all over the probe surface, and wherever there is impedance difference and a reflection, then we will see a bright speckle on our ultrasound pictures. The next mode is M mode. 
stands for motion. And instead of sending ultrasound signals out all over the ultrasound surface, it is just sent out in one plane. This can be done very quickly and results in a very good temporal resolution of our ultrasound pictures. This mode is mainly used to examine heart valves and myocardial movements. We can use Doppler in ultrasound and everyone knows that when an ambulance drives towards you, you can hear high pitched noise. It passes by, the pitch lowers down and if it goes away from you, you can hear a low pitched noise. Doppler uses a shift in frequency and this is used to calculate the speed of fluids. This is used to calculate heart valve opening areas, arterial stenosis, and you use it for the estimation of pulmonary arterial pressure. Color Doppler is used widely and we use that in our famous curriculum for vascular access. Per definition, a red blood flow should flow towards our ultrasound probe, blue blood flow away. Looking at our point of care ultrasound transducers, we've got linear transducers who are high frequency probes. They give us good resolution, but we cannot go very deep with them. So they are perfect to ultrasound superficial structures like nerves, thyroid tissue, breast tissue, testicles. We using it for vascular access in famous. Curvilinear probes are perfect for abdominal ultrasound. They are low to medium frequency transducers and they give us a good depth and good resolution. A phase array probe is mainly used in echocardiography and is not used in the famous curriculum. It is a low frequency probe resulting in good depths and has a particularly small surface area. Next, we want to look at the controls of our ultrasound device. And the first one is depths. On the left hand side, you can see that um, we used an extended depth. And it's always worthwhile starting like that to not miss structures behind the structures we want to see. On the middle picture, that's ideal depth. So we can see our liver kidney interface perfectly well. On the right hand side, we chose at two low depths, so part of the kidney is missing. The next control we should know about is gain. And gain is like the brightness button of our TV. So the middle picture shows a nice grayness throughout all the picture, while on the left hand side it's far too dark and on the right hand side too bright. Most modern ultrasound devices have an auto gain button, what actually gets us really good results. The next control I want to talk about is time gain compensation. If ultrasound passes through tissue, more and more ultrasound is getting absorbed. So deeper areas or areas needing longer time to come back to the ultrasound transducer need to be generally gained more than superficial areas. Most point of care devices only have a superficial and a deep area time gain compensation, while departmental devices on the lower right hand side have a very accurate time gain compensation controls. Finally, I would like to uh, give you some advice for the examination with your ultrasound probe. We can ultrasound in a transverse pattern, like on the left hand side or longitudinally on the right hand side. The curvilinear probe uh, will result in a picture like cutting with a coffee filter to our human tissue. We can slide our ultrasound probe, we can tilt our ultrasound probe, and we can rock our ultrasound probe. In generally, we want to find the organ of interest. We tilt all the way until we cannot see this organ and then slowly tilt or pan through the organ to examine it thoroughly. 
As mentioned before, if we have an air tissue surface, then all ultrasound will get reflected. So we do want to avoid colon, which is air filled, to obstruct organs behind. There are a couple of tricks we can try for that. One of them is to use deep inspiration. This results in the liver getting pushed down and pushing the colon out of the way so we can see our kidney behind our liver. The other method of optimizing our picture is to slowly squeeze out the air in our colon and that's demonstrated up here where we will be able to see structures behind a fully collapsed colon. Different positions certainly can improve our picture quality as well. So for instance, a left lateral position is perfect for echocardiography, but also displays a bowel in the abdomen and can improve our picture quality. So in this session, I talked about physics of ultrasound and introduced basic ultrasound modes, controls, and how to examine our patients.